afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's event, Investing in Science and Technology for the Future of U.S. Competitiveness. My name is John Bennett and I'm editor at large at CQ Roll Call, where I've covered Washington's policy and political debates for nearly two decades. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Science and Technology Action Committee, for partnering with us to make this event possible. To kick off today's program, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sethuraman Panchanathan, Director of the National Science Foundation. Mr. Director, over to you. Thank you, John. I am delighted to be able to be part of this event because how we invest in science and technology is essential to ensuring the nation's global competitiveness. So I want to thank CQ Roll Call and the Science and Technology Action Committee for hosting this critical discussion. Our economic and national security depend on three things, investing in the technology of the future, building innovation ecosystems throughout the nation, and developing all the talent that exists across the entire nation. And when you do that, you can foster innovation anywhere and ensure that there is opportunity everywhere. The first of those things we have already been doing for more than 70 years at NSF. And we are going to continue to make those investments in fundamental and basic research across the entire spectrum of science and engineering. But now we are at a critical point where seven decades of investments have put us on a launch pad to tremendous possibilities going forward. Think of technologies like AI, quantum computing, biotechnology, advanced communications, or advanced manufacturing. The nations that fully harness these technologies will have huge advantages economically and geopolitically. To do this, we have to recommit ourselves to building on the investments we have made in science, engineering, and technology. We have to scale the investments we are making today to unleash the discoveries and breakthroughs that will define tomorrow. We have to see technological growth and entrepreneurial opportunities by building innovation ecosystems in every region of our nation. Good ideas are democratized. So we must have the infrastructure in place so that no matter where you are in the nation, you can take those ideas and turn them into new technology and big breakthroughs that can fuel our economy and bolster our communities. The way to do that is by building innovation ecosystems, places where researchers, educational institutions, businesses, industry, state and local governments, nonprofits, and communities that can all come together to identify important challenges and come up with solutions that improve people's lives and strengthen communities. Lastly, and most importantly, we have to quickly develop the domestic talent that is resident throughout the nation in every geographic area and every demographic background. There are millions of people across every part of the country that have the ability to succeed in STEM careers. I do not only mean as researchers or engineers. I mean the whole range of careers that rely on technical skills or advanced education or specialized knowledge and training. We need to do everything we can to make sure that they have access to the educational and career opportunities that are the foundation of our nation's future workforce. At NSF, we know how important these three pieces are because we sit right at the center of investing in exploratory and use-inspired research, supporting the transition from lab to market through programs like the America Seed Fund and strengthen education and workforce training across all STEM disciplines at every grade level. And it is a very exciting time at NSF right now. I would say every exciting time across our nation because we have just launched our first new directorate in more than 30 years, the Directorate for Technology, Innovation and Partnerships. This new directorate will work with programs across NSF and with other federal agencies, industry, nonprofits, and more to expedite technology development in emerging areas that are crucial for the United States technological leadership and central to tackling the great issues of the day like climate change and future pandemics. And we are thrilled that the White House's fiscal year 2023 budget request has proposed allocating more than $2 billion for this new directorate to invest in emerging industries, focus on priority areas such as advanced manufacturing, advanced wireless, 
artificial intelligence, biotechnology, microelectronics and semiconductors, as well as quantum information science. I'm thrilled to see the tremendous bipartisan support for strengthening the nation's competitiveness in these areas. I am looking forward to working with Congress to see the Bipartisan Innovation Act signed into law and securing the resources necessary to implement this important vision. Because when we do this, we are going to see that innovation can happen anywhere. And we're going to have opportunities everywhere. And that is how we ensure that the United States remains the global leader in discovery, innovation, entrepreneurship, and technological advancements. Thank you again for the great work you're doing to highlight this issue, and I'm looking forward to hearing the insights from today's speakers. Thank you, John, and back to you. Thank you, Dr. Pachanathan, for kicking us off with those great remarks. Next up, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Christina Johnson, president of The Ohio State University. Dr. K. Husband's Feeling, Dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and Jordan Crenshaw. He's Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Technology Engagement Center. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, John. I wanted to kick off our discussion, and we can go uh, around the panel and just talk about the major challenges in, in the STEM space uh, right now. Is it is it workforce? Is it uh, general funding? Is it R&D? Uh, is it the China, China challenge? Or is it some combination um, of all of those? And I wanted to, to start off uh, with Jordan with kind of the industry perspective. Uh, I think that's a, a perspective that um, in our reporting, it seems to be more and more important um, every day, the private sector. There are call, we hear calls for the private sector to, to be doing more. And uh, so, I, Jordan, I want you to kick us off. So, John, I think the answer is yes. Uh, there are many areas uh, that are uh, causing uh, alarm when it comes to competitiveness, when it comes to technology from a global perspective. Um, I think as we uh, talk about um, R&D in particular, uh, the private sector, its share of um, R&D spending has actually gone up significantly since the space race day, since actually mm -hmm. it's almost doubled since 1965. Um, but, but the problem is, is that we still need a robust basic research ecosystem in the United States. Um, and, and that's money that goes to universities uh, to do the basic research that then can be applied and done at scale by industry. And it's part of the virtuous uh, cycle of, of development. A uh, couple examples, uh, the, uh, the federal government's role in, in basic research on the ARPANET leading to the internet or uh, some of the work being done at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the early uh, part of this century on mRNA um, that was actually taken up by Moderna and Pfizer to become the, 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 the coronavirus vaccine. So uh, there is a virtuous uh, cycle of, of research and an ecosystem that needs to be uh, balanced and put in place. <laughs> Uh, I think China is an issue. China is working to outspend us also when it comes uh, to R&D. But we've also got other areas as well, too. Uh, we need to ensure that we have a high-skilled workforce in place, uh, and whether that's uh, done through immigration reform uh, or uh, increasing the talent pipeline here at home with STEM education, that's going to be vital uh, for the 21st century. Uh, and then finally, there are other issues that we need to address that we need to do some basic investment in as well. Uh, one of those is the fact that uh, we're experiencing a massive a semiconductor shortage uh, globally and, and ensuring that um, we put the dollars and the right tax incentives uh, into producing semiconductors uh, that goes into all of the technological uh, work that we do in terms of electronics uh, in our economy, uh, but also to making sure that we have the right tax incentives uh, for research and development. So, uh, John, it's really an all of the above approach uh, when it comes to ensuring American leadership in this space. Right. Dr. Johnson, that's quite the list that he just <laughs> laid out. Um, from your perspective, uh, how would you, you, as our friends in the military, military would say, how would you rack and stack those? What do you think are the biggest ones? And what can Washington do, uh, maybe do better? Washington can always do better, from my perspective, uh, to help out the sector and, and to start addressing some of these challenges. 
Well, thank you very much. And, you know, Jordan, I think you, you, you nailed it in a lot of ways. So from a university perspective, and, and I'm sure uh, Dean Husband's feeling uh, is similar, is that we're in the education business. We're in providing the workforce of the future. And, you know, I, I think about that workforce has become even more sophisticated since I was uh, studying 40 years ago at Stanford in electrical engineering. Uh, but a couple of things uh, uh, we, it would be bare thinking about going backwards and then coming forward. So although Jordan said that and it's true that um, pri uh, private sector funding has doubled and increased since uh, you know, the moonshot days. I think if you look at specific industries like the semiconductor industry, if you go back to 1980, you know, 1982, uh, the private sector um, was funding about half of the R&D. It was the federal sector that really launched that industry. Today, the private sector is investing 20 times more than the, the, um, the public sector. So we need to continue to invest in, as uh, Jordan said, Basic research, I would say fundamental research, right? Because uh, I don't think there's anything basic about the extraordinary work that's being done. But um, but it, it takes a long time. So think about, you mentioned it, uh, Moderna and mRNA. You can actually go back to the work of Tom Check, the University of Colorado, Boulder, 78, won the Nobel Prize in what, the early 80s um, or, or about 87. He was the first one to recognize that RNA had more of a role to play than just you know, being a library with books on it, if you will, it actually could send messages. Think about that. Without that fundamental change in the role of RNA, you might not have vaccines today. And so that investment 40 years ago laid the groundwork for us to uh, be able to turn this pandemic around. But if we go back to um, the importance that I know we, we heard from uh, Director Punchinatham, um, we need to invest in the fundamental work. And we do that in life sciences through NIH. NIH has a very robust budget of 45 billion. But the National Science Foundation, which is really what's carrying the water on a, a lot of the systems work in both the physical and natural sciences, is about 8.5. Now, we just had announced two weeks ago a new directorate, uh, the um, so called uh, TIPS, so Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. And that is something that can really fuel the next generation of these technologies that may not bear fruit for 20, 30, 40 years. So I think it's really important to have that. The second piece I would say about the National Science Foundation, they've really been a leaders in workforce development. They're the first to say, let's reach out and let's combine the community colleges, the K through 12 with the research enterprise. And let's get these students really excited about research when they're young. Because then they're going to go in and help fuel uh, the future of these really interesting technologies. I think the last thing on workforce is we have to think about demographics and geographics. Uh -huh. Demographics, uh, you know, Intel announced their million girl uh, moonshot, which is to get a, a million girls involved in STEM. Uh, we need to look at underrepresented minorities, women. We really need to open up the joy of the STEM education to everyone. And then there's the geographics. For such a long period of time, we've relied on the coast, the West Coast, and the East Coast. And oh. I think you've seen with the Intel investment in Ohio, in Texas, that that's really the new innovation hub, if you will, uh, right. of the country. So looking for what the government can do and, and will do with the Bipartisan Innovation Act, I think it's to look at these regional innovation hubs, which is a brilliant idea, you know, $10 billion to really get all the demographics and the geographics working uh, towards um, continuing our prominence and eminence in science, technology, energy, uh, uh, engineering, and math. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Dean Husband's feeling, uh, we had uh, a chat uh, prior to this about uh, the new NSF uh, technology director. I know you have some thoughts on that. Uh, so I want you to, to talk a little bit about what that means, what role can that new office play, and also, of course, want to hear uh, what you think are the biggest challenges as well. Well, I am so happy to be here, and um, Jordan and Christina both laid out a very robust sense of what do we need to do now? What do we need to do for science and engineering of the future? And the focus, I think, is on people and therefore the talent pool. And that affects everything else that we're talking about. The focus is also on people in terms of our constituents. What do we want? What do we understand um, as important in our lives? 
And so one of the things that I did was I went back and I wanted to go through for the last um, maybe 10 to 15 years and look at what were the science advisors setting for, forth as priorities for our nation. And those items really do reflect what we want, not just scientists and engineers, not best just us in the academy, so to speak, in, in, in um, universities and colleges, but really what do we need and what do we value as a nation? And it comes down to things like basic needs for the poor. It comes down to healthy lives, um, clean energy future, safe and secure um, United States, safe and secure world, public health, all of the things that you just heard um, Jordan and, and President Johnson talk about comes down to those values, things that we really care about. So from my perspective, focusing on the talent pool and a diverse talent pool, as we just heard, matters. And that is one of the things that we see at the National Science Foundation in one of the existing directorates, Education and Human Resources, but also is picked up quite a bit in technology and innovation partnerships. Those linkages, those partnerships, that's, that, that title is just essential. Innovation is the tail end of the, the fundamental research that we just heard about. It's right. where all of that meets the street, where it's commercialized, where it actually does provide the value that our citizens want out of our science and engineering system. And then these partnerships are essential, not just partnerships between, say, the government and private sector and philanthropic institutions, but it's also partnerships among different types of, of avenues for research. So one of the things that we see in this in stack is that we are asking for that coordination across agencies so that we have the coordination within agencies, of course, and that's one of the things that TIP will do all across the directorates and, and within NSF and within between NSF and, and corporate America and philanthropies and such. But also we're going to see, as, as Christina said earlier, the National Institutes of Health and things that are, can be done with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with the National Science Foundation, with the Department of Energy, with, with, with those combinations, that coordination is essential. So that kind of diversity is important too. But last thing I'll say, because I started with people not only people who are our constituents, the users, the ones that value what we do in science and engineering, but also the, the folks that need to be part of this engineering system, this science system. We all need to be part of that system. And it is a geographic distribution. We need broadband in rural America. We need broadband in the inner city. We need to have clean water in Flint, we need to have clean water um, in Appalachia. I mean, so right. you, you have to see it as, in my view, what do people value? And therefore, what is our science and engineering system providing for all of us? Right. That's why these investments are so important. They're well, truly our investments, not just expenditures. Sure, and Dean, speaking of investments, uh, the House and Senate have been working on uh, different versions of, uh, of legislation that uh, is designed to get at some of these challenges mm -hmm. and continue investing. Uh, there is a difference between, of course, investing and spending, and critics will say that Congress in Washington spend too much and invest too little. So, uh, you know, the bills, th th this is headed to a conference committee. Congress, uh, we'll see if they remember how to do a conference committee like this, uh, but that's a little bit down the road. Uh, how well do these two bills, because they are similar, especially the technology provisions, uh, there are a lot of similarities there. How well does, do these pieces of legislation, which will eventually become one, um, continue to invest in these, uh, in these areas that, that you guys have laid out? And also, are there, are there deficiencies or, or places where the conference committee could improve the bills? Dean, I'll go to you first. Oh. 
Thank you. Yeah, we'll go in reverse order on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I know that Jordan's going to hit it out of the park here, but I think that there's a lot of room for both bills to be on the same page, of course, and making sure that the agenda serves all. That is the primary purpose. Um, investments, and truly, these are investments, as we heard earlier. Um, some of what has been funded 20, 30 years ago, we see in everyday lives. And those are the types of investments that really matter. We have to rely on the experts, quite frankly, to understand, well, we don't have a crystal ball. How will you know that this investment today is going to be beneficial in five years, in 20 years even? We, we do have an understanding, though, of how that ecosystem works and where it is wise to put those investments in. And I think both sides of uh, both bills can address those items. And we have a system of trying to determine how to invest the funds wisely in centers or is it by specific individuals but we have a systematic way of doing so. It, it involves peer review. It involves working exactly. with communities. It involves um, the scientific workforce, but it involves um, STEM individuals that are in our workforce that are in STEM proximate areas. It involves, and one of the things I really appreciate about, appreciate about what President Johnson said, it involves community colleges, research two and research one universities, and again, back to engagement with community. So I hope that both bills will also address how those funds are um, beneficial and, and span not just one area, but span these different areas that we value, but also means by which we can get about doing the business of this country within the science and engineering workforce. That is so essential. Right, right. Dr. Johnson, uh, what do you think of, of these two bills? And are there any areas where you think the, the conference committee could improve uh, what's already been written? I'm super excited about the bipartisan innovation act and the conferencing. I think this is a tremendous and I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Senator Sherrod Brown and Rob Portman from the great state of Ohio and their work in, in bringing this together. You know, I, I think the Dean husband's feeling said it just right on the important bit in my opinion about this conferencing is that we create these regional hubs because this is the, the hubs where they're basically mini Manhattan projects. Right, where we're going to get together and take on some of the big problems, and, and Dean Feeling went through many of them, and and get after solving them in, in the way that we know as Americans how to do. So, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the Chips Act. When you think about in the last 30 years, and this is from the CEO of Intel's written testimony to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Since 1990, we used to manufacture over a third of all the chips in the world. 30 years later, we're down by a third of that. We're at what, 12%? Uh, if that keeps going, that you, the, the chip shortages we see now, which is why we can't have cars, why we don't have our endpoint devices, why we're, we are really, everything has a chip in it from tractors to your iPhone. If we can't get a hold of the chips, then that's really gonna be a fundamental change in society. You're already seeing that happen now through the COVID. So I think that's important. And the last thing I would say is a, is a pitch with regard to international competitiveness. I think what we need to do, and I, I've said this in every venue where I can, is I think we need to add a, a supplement to every grant in science, technology, engineering, math, that would fund patents that would come out of that research. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're interested and concerned about being internationally competitive, we've got to file patents in those international countries. Mm -hmm. We've got to file them here. We don't have the funds at universities to fund that work. It would only be a few billion total across the um, enterprise, but that makes a big difference. So there you have it. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Jordan, over to you. I know industry uh, follows uh, a bill like this at every step of the way. So over at the chamber, uh, how are you guys feeling about these bills? And, and like I've asked um, our other panelists, are there areas that 
where the chamber really wants the conferees to dig in and, and improve uh, on the two products. Now, I, I think one of the most important things to this process, and, and given um, uh, just the necessity to compete internationally, we need a bipartisan package. And, and it's for that reason that uh, we, we in industry lean more toward the Senate side, that version of the legislation uh, that was introduced. Um, why is that? Why, why, why the Senate version? Well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, it actually provides the money. Uh, the House version really didn't provide it. Um, and, and so when you're talking about investing, um, you know, it's that $120 uh, you know, billion dollars that's going to be invested in those key technology focus areas like artificial intelligence, advanced communications, uh, biotech. Uh, you need the money there. Um, and also, I think, as President Johnson mentioned, you know, getting the funding for those, um, uh, you know, regional tech hubs is also going to be key. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone is included. Uh, it's not just uh, Silicon Valley and it's not just uh, the East Coast uh, that dominate this conversation. We want to make sure that uh, the entire country is part of this. Um, the CHIPS Act um, is also vital uh, for passage. Uh, we need to have that to make sure that we can continue to compete. But I also think um, there, there are a lot more partisan pieces that are in the House bill um, dealing with things like outbound investment screening, uh, some areas around the PRO Act that, that I don't necessarily think need to be addressed in this bill if we want to get to a bipartisan bill. Uh, I, I think we need to make sure, and, and the Senate bill also had some issues with the country of origin labeling that didn't really have a lot of uh, debate as to, to what was going into that before it went into USICA. But Fundamentally speaking, we need a bipartisan package uh, that also addresses the core issues of research and development and competition. And, and if we can get rid of the extraneous uh, pieces that are more partisan in nature, we need to focus on areas where we all can agree. Right. Well, we are running out of time. Uh, this has been really great, but I want to go around uh, maybe just yes or no and ask, uh, like I said, because Congress hasn't done a lot of these really you know policy heavy conferences other than you know, the, the National Defense Authorization Act really over the last decade, and it is an election year. It's a midterm election year. Um, do we think that Congress can get this, what is now a bipartisan bill, uh, to President Biden's desk? As the jaded journalist in the room who's watched Congress closely, I'm going to go ahead and say I have my doubts uh, that they can get this done, but um, I just want to get your thoughts before we get out of here. Jordan, what do you think? Uh, the conference process will probably take at least a few weeks. Uh, the only problem I think we have right now is that we have a calendar that seems to end right before August uh, in an election year. Uh, but, you know, I'm still cautiously optimistic, but the calendar is, is coming up against us. So that's why we're pushing on Congress to move quickly. Definitely. Dr. Johnson. Absolutely. I believe in this country. I believe in democracy. I know they can get it done. Okay. Uh, Dean Husband's feeling? 100% agreed with President Johnson. This has to happen. This will get done. Okay. Um, optimism uh, does not, uh, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not a currency that flows in Washington these days, but um, I appreciate that you guys are optimistic. Thank you all so much for your insights and for joining us today. Next, I'm going to give the floor to Jenny LeRae, Vice President of Strategy and Communications at Research America who will be speaking with Dr. Keith Yamamoto, Vice Chancellor for Science Policy and Strategy at University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Suda Parikh, CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and Mary Woolley, President and CEO of Research America, to share their insights as board members of the Science and Technology Action Committee. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for moderating this discussion today. Thanks, John. What a terrific conversation. I'm excited to be here with three of the co-chairs and founders of the Science Technology Action Committee, or STAC, Mary Woolley, Suda Parikh, and Keith Yamamoto. The world faces unprecedented challenges, yet U.S. leadership in science and technology is falling behind. Is that why you created STAC two years ago? Keith, let's start with you. Well, STAC highlighted four challenges that are indeed existential, uh, environment and climate change, energy production, utilization and storage, food and water security, and of course, public health and healthcare, where pandemic preparedness is one critical element of need. Only transformative breakthroughs in science and technology will allow us to meet these challenges. Uh, we called on government 
to re-energize its commitment to U.S. leadership in science and technology to motivate and enable those breakthroughs. Thanks, Keith. Mary. COVID-19 has shined a light on the importance of science, that's for sure. Yet science has too often been taken for granted, emerging only in response to a crisis and then retreating to a back burner in terms of priorities. But in fact, science is more like national defense. Indeed, it is a defense of national health and prosperity and economic growth. And it should have the same level of priority in Washington year in and year out. In fact, eight in 10 Americans across political, the political spectrum said in a very recent poll that investing in research is important to economic growth. And almost 90% said it's important for the U.S. to be a global leader in science and technology. The Science and Technology Action Committee strongly believes that now is the time to realize those public expectations and drive science and technology forward. Thanks, Mary. Let's hear from you, Sudip. Thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, if you look at the share of our economy that's going to federal science and technology, we've been at a dangerously low place for years. It's less than 1%, less than 1% of GDP compared to double that in the 1960s. Uh, China is not only catching up, uh, many other countries in the world are catching up, but China itself has a goal to surpass the United States, and that is not good for the U.S. economy, for our workforce, or for our national security. Thanks, Suda. So here's a question. The private sector's investment in science and technology has been growing, and it's substantial, surpassing that of the federal government. So what is the government's role in science and technology? Why do we need both? Mary, let's start with you. Sure. Science and technology is, after all, an ecosystem in which different sectors play complementary and often interlocking roles. It's, it's a three Ds, if you will, of discovery, development, and delivery. The federal government is the first stop, for the most part, for basic science, that seed corn that's the necessary starting point for innovation. Thanks, Mary. And Keith, what are your thoughts? Mary's right, 3D, newly discovered knowledge about people and the universe that we inhabit um, is really the product of the basic research that Mary mentioned. Only government can support and maintain that effort. The new knowledge can then be developed by private industry. And although it's heartening that industry investment is increasing, today's global economy demands that government, academia, industry partnerships be formed that can de-risk the bold developments needed to address the big challenges. Thanks, Keith. Suda, I'm gonna to turn to you. What does Stack recommend at this juncture? Where are the opportunities? You know, we've got this opportunity. We've had an opportunity to enact once in a generation bipartisan policy. Uh, and that opportunity is coming to us through the competitiveness legislation. Leadership from both parties and in both chambers have pledged to go to conference and to complete the work. This legislation will enable us to better focus on a number of neglected scientific areas, and it's also going to bring opportunities to be part of the s and economy to more communities around the country. That's incredibly important, more communities around the country taking part. We're also heartened to see significant increases for the National Science Foundation and other science agencies in the president's budget. It's an important down payment, but we're still going to have a long way to go because we're making up for years of neglect. And if we fail to step up right now, what's at stake? Keith? Well, at one level, we'll lose the opportunity to tap into countless ideas and innovations if we don't attract more people into the science and technology economy. We'll lose opportunities to create high quality, good paying jobs, and we'll continue to decline in the face of global competitiveness. More broadly, the challenges I mentioned at the beginning in health, climate, food and water, and energy threaten our national security, our economic and job security, our global leadership, 
our everyday lives. Basically, we can't afford to fail. Mary, do you have some thoughts on that? Thanks, Jenny. Yes, uh, the Science and Technology Action Committee believes that what's at stake is the future. In the 20th century, the U.S. was the dominant innovative force in the world, from the Wright brothers to stopping polio in its tracks, to Apollo, to the internet, and so much more. For all of the reasons shared by my colleagues and our panelists today, we simply must not wait any longer to seize the opportunities of the 21st century and meet the challenges and expectations of the public. We hope viewers will learn more about STAC and have their organizations and companies endorse the plan. Check out sciencetechaction.org. Thanks, Mary. And in addition to thanking our viewers and asking them to learn more about STAC, I think we have another request, uh, which is um, pretty time timely right now. Sudo. <clears throat> Thanks, Jenny. Uh, look. As I said, this is a once in a generation opportunity uh, and our congressional leaders and the leaders in the administration have shown real leadership in getting us this close, this close to the finish line on the Competitiveness Act and on further appropriations for science and technology. So I'd urge all of you uh, to, uh, to go to your elected representatives, give them the support they need and urge them to uh, to pass and complete the Competitiveness Act to get it over the finish line uh, and to ensure that we make that down payment in appropriations. Suda, Mary Keith, thank you for your vision uh, and the work you're doing uh, with Stack. Now I'll turn it over to our moderator, John, to continue this very timely conversation. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Dr. Yamamoto, Dr. Parikh, and uh, of course, thank you, Mary. Next up, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Sally Benson. She's Deputy Director for Energy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and Dr. Jerry Richmond. She is Undersecretary for Science and Innovation at the Department of Energy. Thank you both for joining me today. We've heard a lot about uh, the China competition bills and I wanna get to that in a moment. Uh, but I want to start with getting the administration's perspective on the major uh, challenges right now in the STEM sector. We've heard from industry, we've heard from academia, um, and we will hear from uh, Capitol Hill in a moment. But I wanted to, to, to kind of walk through the administration's policies. Of course, it's budget week. Uh, President Biden's uh, what some call first real budget for a new administration is the second budget. Uh, that was released Monday. What are the priorities uh, right now, and and what do you need? What do you want to get done beyond the China bill and the appropriations process as as this fiscal year uh, uh, heads to an end uh, in in September? And I want to start, uh, Dr. Benson, kick us off. Sure. Well, uh, thank you very much, John. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start off focusing on, on STEM and STEM education. Um, I come from a, a university that, uh, you know, has a broad uh, set of options for students. And, you know, what we're starting to see is that, you know, there's this massive uh, movement towards computing science as sort of the, you know, STEM, uh, STEM option of choice. And, you know, computing science is great. Uh, and computing science is not only great in and of itself, but it actually has uh, effects, you know, throughout, you know, the entire economy. So there are many ways to do that. But what we need to be able to do is to have students realize that there's a much broader diversity of choices uh, available. You know, I think about, you know, things like the earth sciences, material sciences, chemistry, and, and so forth. And, and, it's, and, and what we see is that it's not really clear to these young students, high school students, incoming college students, what the job choices are um, in America if you pursue that. So, so we really need to do some work in that regard is, you know, make it clearer. If you start here, here's where you can go. Uh, the other thing is, is that students, you know, fantastically, they're really passionate about the, the work they do. And many of them are motivated, well, two things. One is you, you know, want to have a good career, you want to make enough money to support a good lifestyle. But many of them are passionate for making a difference. 
And, and, and again, that sort of gets back to, you know, is how do you articulate the case that if you major in chemistry, you know, you can have a big impact on climate change or the environment. And, and again, that's that's not clear enough. And and then finally, you know, I, I work in energy. That's uh, you know, that's my world. And and one of the things that's always surprising to me is the connection between um, climate solutions and energy is not really clear to people. So I think that the government, I, you know, I think that we just have to get out the work. If you want to solve the climate problem, eighty percent of that is solving the energy problem. And, and and how do you solve the energy problem? Well, you do STEM fields, you, you know, you and you can do almost anything. It could be any field of engineering, any of the of the, the basic uh, physical sciences, biological sciences. Doesn't matter. You can help transform the energy system, which is really the grand challenge, I think, for the 21st century. Um, so that's sort of one challenge. I'll just say a couple more things. Um, you know, retaining, you know, we educate a lot of people in masters, PhDs. Actually, you know, there's a huge investment that most STEM graduate degrees are, are funded uh, because the students are doing research as part of their studies. And again, what we see is a lot of um, attrition. People will finish a STEM degree and, and, and get, again, frustrated. They don't really see the direct paths to impact. And so what I see is a lot of people shifting to say, oh, well, I want to work, work on policy because I can take my STEM knowledge and, and focus on policy. And that's a faster way to solve the you know, pressing problems that, that people are feeling. So, so I, you know, when I think about this, I think it's really a symptom of a broader sort of broken innovation ecosystem, you know, in, in the United States. If we look at sort of the miracle that's occurring today where wind and solar and batteries and EVs, you know, these are like the cheapest forms of, of energy and, you know, battery prices have been slashed and so forth. Well, where were all those invented? Those were invented in America, right? You know, in the in the 1950s, we had the first solar panel, Bell Labs, I mean, on and on and on. All these things were, you know, invented here, but we didn't go on and commercialize them, right? So they ended up being commercialized all over the world. And there you start setting up outside America, this virtuous cycle of, 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 of learning and doing and, and reinventing. And so students leaving college, you know, aren't seeing that there are all these great jobs for them uh, in, in doing what their passions would, would have them pursue. So uh, I think if we can fix that whole cycle, then then we can get back where people are going to, you know, vote with their feet and, you know, stay in the STEM field. So I think it's a complicated set of issues. I think they're all solvable. And I think the administration, you know, through its strong emphasis on rebuilding energy supply chains is, you know, doing exactly what we need to do. And, and I think that's a good start. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. We, yeah, we've heard a lot uh, during this event about the workforce and the challenges and, and some of the, um, the things that that both Congress and, and the administration are doing. And uh, Dr. Richman, I wanted you to pick up there and, and kind of list your top challenges and, and what you see the administration uh, doing uh, to get at those. Well, in terms of the, let me focus first on the workforce building on what uh, Sally has just articulated so well. And what really concerns me is that as that we're under uh, investing in education at all levels in STEM fields, but uh, but it's not just colleges and universities, it's community colleges also. And, and I am concerned about the fact that a lot of the the people that are going to be driving this engine with regards to fundamental research that's so necessary to development, to deployment, um, those are the ones that are getting a master's and PhDs in science. And right now, we pay them minimum wage to go to, to do the research. That's the underpinnings of all the things that we want. So we've got to have enough resources to be able to pay them uh, a wage so that they can actually uh, have a family while they're in graduate school, while they can actually start saving some money as they go further. And we know from research that we lose more women in underrepresented groups than certainly our majority groups, partly because they can't financially afford to do it. And right. they can't afford to do that anymore. 
But, you know, beyond that, we at the Department of Energy uh, are firmly committed to helping to build that workforce. But we also believe that competitiveness legislation, like the Bipartisan Innovation Act, is critical to tackle, as Sally mentioned, the supply chain disruptions and the inflation head on and lower prices for the middle class. So it means more in America and investments in domestic manufacturing and our economic strength so that we can now compete China and the rest of the world and build a more resilient economy to, to uh, avoid the kind of shocks that we've uh, seen recently in the last uh, several weeks. And so we truly believe that what, what we're on now in the Department of Energy with this new uh, build out that we have now in deployment, that we are uniquely poised to work on and make critical uh, investments as well as critical knowledge in going all the way from discovery, basic science, to applications, to development, and to deployment. And we've got some phenomenal national labs to help us do that, as well as the folks at the universities that Sally and I are so used to being around. Right. Well, uh, dive into what I think has been one of the main themes of the event so far, and that is the, uh, the two China competition bills uh, that, that the House and Senate passed, the Senate, of course, acting this week, setting up a conference committee. Uh, and as I said on an, uh, a previous panel, we'll see if Congress remembers how to do one of these uh, conference committees outside of, you know, maybe the National Defense Authorization Act, which um, November or December they, uh, they come back to and, and they push that through at the end of the year. But we haven't seen, you know, a, a big sprawling policy bill there. Of course, they're spending in here, too. Um, we heard from uh, the chamber saying that in the House bill, you know, not all the money's there, but the Senate bill provides it. That's the kind of uh, difference that the House uh, and Senate Conference Committee will have to tackle in coming weeks. We don't even have conferees yet. Uh, we heard uh, from our friend at the chamber who mentioned uh, the legislative calendar. You know, you, it's a long time between here and Election Day. But, you know, they're going on recess after next week, Memorial Day recess, July 4th recess, August recess. Then they have to come back, keep the government funded while they go run for re-election. So the legislative calendar is truncated. Um, and I just want to talk about, I want to put you guys on the spot. I know the administration has, a, has skin in the game here. I definitely want to get a bill to the president's desk and have him sign it into law. But because Congress hasn't done this in a while, uh, not successfully in a while. What can the administration do to help the conferees, you know, once they get organized and start their work of trying to find a compromise? Because there are some big differences in the bills. What can the administration do? Uh, Dr. Richmond, how about you go first? Well, I think it's really important, uh, and the administration is certainly working hard on this, is really to um, get across the idea of how critically important this is right now. Right now, we are at a critical point whether it be having to do with COVID or whether it has to do with the fact or, or chips or, or uh, also our key issue is climate change, right? And so we have to do this now. We are primed to have with our resources, certainly in the Department of Energy, to move fast, but we've got to have the resources to do that. So for example, in the chips area, um, we know that we need to, do, to have more chips in this country, but we also know we need to be on the forefront of developing new ones. And so that means we need to have the capabilities to, to, to do that. And then the Department of Energy, I don't think a lot of people realize it, but our DOE light source facilities are actually critical to that, and they're already built. <laughs> They're already built. You right. know, we are no longer in microelectronics. We are in nanoelectronics. And to be able to understand, for companies to be able to come in and use our facilities and be able to, uh, to see how, how good their etch is, if we call it that, and how, how well these, these semiconductors work, they've got to have one of our big light sources that are like the size of a huge arena. And you can't just build those overnight, but they're already they're right. ready to go. So it's important for Congress to realize we have assets now that with the funding, we could really move a lot faster on key issues that we need to address in this country. Right. And, and, and Dr. Benson, what can the... I'm here. Oh, yeah, Dr. Benson, I just wanted to, to get your perspective. What can your office do to help the Comfries along uh, once they get organized and, and start trying to hammer these bills into one? 
Yeah. So we focus on, on innovation, you know, that's our seat at the table and, and, you know, energy innovation, I, I think is something that we can all agree on that it, it helps our economy. Uh, it helps our, our national security. It helps our energy security. It helps our competitiveness and it helps our environment. So, you know, this is something that absolutely checks all boxes. And, and if we do it right, it can also make energy much more affordable. So I think we need to keep banging the drum that, the, you know, make the case that this is, this is good for America. And, you know, if we look over the next 30 years, you know, if you lift the hood on the energy system 30 years from now, it's going to look radically different than the way it looks today. And this is the biggest opportunity, I think, of a generation to reinvest in becoming the world leaders. And, you know, yes, we're great at inventing things, but we can't stop there. We have to invest in building it here in America. We have to, we have to become exports. And, you know, just looking at one technology that, that you know, we just had a White House summit on, on fusion energy. And uh, you might be saying, what? Fusion energy? But, you know, it's actually remarkable. The Department of Energy scientists and, uh, have, you know, made major breakthroughs in, in this technology. And, and if we sprint, and, and I think we can all agree that if we bring our forces together, we can sprint across the, the, the finish line. And the private sector is also eager to participate. You know, they're investing billions of dollars just last year alone in trying to make it so America's first and we become the leaders in this absolutely game changing technology that will put us on a firm footing for the rest of the 21st century. You mentioned partici per participation, easy for me to say. And I'm just curious, you know, the president's uh, busy, uh, of course, the conflict in, in Ukraine and uh, still fighting against COVID and inflation. He's got a lot on his plate, but he has talked about uh, these China competition bills and the need to get a bill to his desk. Will we see him lean in a little bit as the conferees uh, get to work and, and not so much put pressure on them, but will he talk publicly about the importance of, of getting a compromise? Well, I, I can say he's the president who loves science and who loves innovation and is doing more than we've seen in in in, uh, in, in an enormous amount of time to rebuild the foundations of you know the American economy using using energy and climate change as one of those springboards. So I, I think we can be certain of that. Okay, I, I think we had a little technical blip there. Apologies uh, to the audience, but uh, we are we're back and rolling here. I also wanted to get into, uh, there's been some, some mentions off and on during the event of clean energy and research and development in the clean energy space. Uh, Dr. Richmond and then Dr. Benson, uh, talk a little bit about how the administration is, is trying to speed up research in the clean energy space and you know what, what, uh, what the private sector can do to help, what, what the universities can do to help, and uh, and just overall kind of really give this a, a jolt. Well, the uh, we here at the Department of Energy, we got the big jolt with the infrastructure uh, bill, which allows us now right. to take all these discoveries and take them further. And so, what's really uh, you know what's really important for us is to make sure that we get that going faster and that's why the the bill is so important and so we are really focused i mean we are as the secretary of energy says we are the solutions agency you know we have capabilities to go all from the discovery applied develop all the way and the way industry can get involved is to tell us exactly what they need come and collaborate with us so that we can understand the kind of developments that can help them i want to piggyback on something that sally just said and that is fusion so you know uh in order to get to this point where we can start to sprint, it took 40 years of very fundamental physics that most people would consider to be really esoteric, but it is not. It's what we've needed to, to be able to now sprint on fusion. So it, it really is a fabulous example of how putting money into basic research and for us in the Office of Science is so critical because those discoveries uh, are what fuel the engine to get us all the way down the road. And it's not like a relay race because that fundamental science has to be embedded all the way through the system when somebody in deployment realizes it's a problem. So we're just all on it with regards to a number of earth shots, three earth shots so far, and these are really taking on the biggest challenges that we've had uh, with regards to uh, clean energy. Okay, Dr. Benson, you mentioned your office is the innovation office. 
So, you know, what are you guys working on um, in this space, in the clean energy space to, again, you know, give it a jolt or further jolt and, and take it to the next level? So, so we're focused on identifying these game changers that, if, if successful, they'll make a big difference. So you've heard about fusion, of course, things like advanced nuclear reactors, hydrogen, uh, electrofuels, this idea you could capture carbon dioxide from the air and then take clean energy and literally make a fuel by and a carbon neutral fuel. So that's a big priority. Uh, very long duration energy storage, so seasonal energy storage. Uh, also carbon removal. You know, it's likely that there's going to be some emissions that we simply can't get rid of, but we can scrub them from the atmosphere and capture them and, and put them back underground or turn them into rocks or something like that. So those are the kind of priorities that, that we're focused on. Okay, great. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, the president at the Ford plant in the in the electric pickup truck. Um, I think, in, as an aide put it to me, uh, driving like a bat out of hell. So I know this is uh, <laughs> this is important to the president. Um, Where we've got about a minute and a half left uh, with you folks, and I also wanted to to talk about the importance of not just focusing on, on, on the East Coast and the West Coast for innovation and, and research. Uh, that's something that I know has bipartisan support um, and, 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 and Congress is working on that. I know the administration has stressed that. Talk a little bit about the challenge of doing that and, and using the federal funding and scattering it more uh, across flyover country or the Southwest or, or, or down South. Uh, Dr. Benson, could you uh, go first? Yeah, gosh, you know, I just don't see that as a challenge. I see it as a massive opportunity. Uh, and again, you know, going back to energy, I mean, every part of the country has a, a different set of energy resources, uh, a different workforce, a different set of preferences about the solutions that they think will work best for them. You know, where better to to invent and those and deploy those than, than all across the country? Uh, I think that actually universities are little crucibles for climate solutions you know you've got a passionate group of young people you've got faculty this is the place to bring all these disparate ideas and, and opinions together and, and really get on with solving the problem and in the course of doing that provide an example for for communities and regions and states and so forth so i think it's imperative let's do it uh, dr richmond you get the final word uh, about the importance of, of spreading uh, spreading the funding out Oh, it's critically important, and that's why uh, we've already started programs to get into tribal communities as well as more rural areas and weatherization and other issues like that. It's critically important, and we're there because we've got our national labs all over the country, and they're spreading out their influence uh, around the region, too. So thank you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Dr. Benson. Thank you, Dr. Richmond, for joining us. We really appreciate uh, your insights today. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. To wrap up today's program, I'd like to welcome Representative Frank Lucas. The Congressman represents Oklahoma's third district, and he is the ranking member of the science, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Congressman Lucas, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to be with you, John, and being in the minority in the United States House, I'm kind of the conscience of this process. The Senate does things their own unique way. We in the House uh, do our things in our own unique way. Right. And um, this is going to be an amazing conference process. Well, I want to just dive right in because there's so much to talk about uh, with these two bills. I, I wanted to ask, though, I, I know when when the House version that that eventually passed was released, um, despite what this what Speaker Pelosi says, it was in the middle of the night because I got up early the next day. And here was this sprawling bill that was that China Competition Plus, as we called it internally in our office for a little while. Um, do you still, I know you were frustrated after how that was handled. Uh, do you still feel that frustration? Do you feel, or do you worry that that frustration could bleed into the conference and, and, and maybe the compromise isn't as easy as it would have been otherwise? First, let me say, John, Chairwoman Johnson and I worked very hard to prepare a package of 10 bills to improve right. American competitiveness. 10 bills that passed in bipartisan ways out of committee, everything from reauthorizing the National Science Foundation to reauthorizing the programs at the Department of Energy Research to NIST to a variety of things. And we saw our work product uh, 
Well, it wasn't ignored, but let's just say it wasn't the way that it was put together somewhere in the leadership structure. Now we're about to go to conference. This is an opportunity for the legislative body to work its will to come up with a really good longstanding product. I'm an old Ag Committee chairman. We do a farm bill every five years. We do it in a bipartisan way. We do it both chambers and we ultimately get it signed into law. I'm a veteran of this knuckle dragging, knock down, drag out political kind of stuff. Right. I think we're in good position in the House and we're ready to go. Matter of fact, uh, later today, I think we'll see a votes that will start the process towards a conference. And we in the House, we're fired up, we're enthusiastic. We've heard varying uh, uh, predictions uh, earlier in the in this event about you know whether you guys remember how to do this. You make a very good point about the your uh, agriculture chairmanship and, and doing the farm bill. Do you do you think you can get there? Do you think you will get there and get a, a bill to the president's desk? Yes, John. If you look at uh, the things that that we are ready to accomplish, and ultimately you've got to have a strategic bipartisan bill. It'll pass both chambers, be signed by the president. That means focusing on areas of broad agreement in basic research and competitiveness. If we'll do that, if our Senate colleagues will work with us in that regard, if leadership in the majority will allow House members to be a part of that process, then I think we can get there. There's a lot of things, Johns, we already agree on. The $42 billion uh, allocation towards the CHIP Act, which was authorized in NDAA. We all agree we have to get back in to basic manufacturing of this critical component. We all agree we need to invest more in the National Science Foundation and to create a new uh, tech directorate to improve, to help improve use inspired research. We need to invest more in the Department of Energy. Now, John, in fairness, there's some other areas. Much to my regret in the House, uh, the majority's not chosen to move forward a NASA reauthorization, and that's a part of the Senate bill, so we'll have to work our way through that. Uh, how we invest in the National Science Foundation. Again, we passed a full authorization in the House for both NSF and DOE. I think we provide guidance and focus. And I would argue where some people say perhaps we didn't spend enough money in the House, if you look at what we reauthorize, over the next five years, we propose to double the spending at the National Science Foundation to $78 billion double the spending at the Department of Energy Research Programs to $50 billion, double the NIST spending to $7 billion. Our perspective in the House was they could only absorb and utilize so much money efficiently. Uh, this is a town where when something becomes a cool idea, people want to throw everything imaginable at it. That's not the way you manage resources to maximum possible return. So right. I think we can make it happen. It's going to be hard. I hope leadership on both sides of the building, we'll let this conference committee do its work. I know we can work in a bipartisan way on the on the House side of the equation and the Science Committee if we're allowed to. But there are also several other committees that have pieces of this pie too, John. This is going to be a great big old conference committee. If we have formal conferences, think of pictures from Yalta in 1945 and the great big table and everybody right. around it. It'll be that kind of an effort, but it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. We cannot continue to let our competition around the world outspend us, outinvest us, and then at the same time steal our ideas or utilize our resources that we've developed. We've got to push forward, John. Sure. Are, are there things in the Senate version or, or even in, in the version that eventually passed the House that are just, um, to use an overused term these days, a red line for your side? Oh, we've looked at 50 or 60 or 70 particular items in the Senate bill that may be, uh, if they're going to be in the final language, have to be dramatically refined or focused. Uh, again, as I acknowledge on NASA, there's some areas where the House is running behind that we've got to catch up. My perspective going into a conference committee is that everything's on the table. Every committee and both chambers, majority and minority, are going to have a, a place in the struggle, as we do in the Farm Bill process. Sure. If we're allowed to work our way through this, we'll get to a final product. It won't be days or weeks. It might take a month or two, or it might take longer than that. But we want a final product that will stand the test of time and will not create problems on down the road. Again, as the House did by doubling, not tripling or quadrupling, uh, budgets at a variety of research institutions. We're trying to provide the resources they can absorb. Let's not 
have a boom in spending and then in a Congress or two see the money go away. That's devastating to the scientific community. That's devastating to the research community. We have to avoid that boom and bust kind of a, a perspective that Congress tends to have these days. Right. Speaking of Congress these days, it seems like the pay fors, the offsets, oftentimes are the are the hardest part of the negotiation. Uh, we may see that soon with with a COVID aid bill. I think we're seeing it already with the COVID bill. It the the money, the additional money in the Senate bill. Would would you guys demand that be offset, even if the number comes down? I would suggest to you that in the House of Representatives, we're always focused on the overall budget effect. We're always focused on how it will impact the economy. Right. We don't want to create more inflation than we already have in the national economy because of a variety of issues. Uh, but that list has to be part of the equation. Ultimately, we need to achieve consensus on the things that we can agree on, be able to move forward on those items, decide and there will be items in the Senate package. I think we in the House, at least on my side of the Science Committee, will want to keep. We'll work to make sure that happens, and we'll address the things that perhaps in both packages shouldn't be there. But it's going to be a long slog. Uh, again, I've been through this many times on the Farm Bill. I know how important it is to get to a final product and one that will test, stand the test of time. Our competitors around the world are eating our lunch. We have to take this opportunity, this national focus. How often do you have the major leadership on both sides of the building decide they want to support something with this intensity? I wish it had happened nine months ago. I won't deny that to you, John, but I'm happy we're to this point, and I think we can make something happen. Just got to roll up our sleeves and work and not scream sure. about it, not shout about it. Right. Physically work to get to the final product. Right. You have... Um, do you have a, a, a timeline in mind? Uh, you know, there, there, it, it looks like there's a lot of time left in the year, but the legislative calendar, you've got a number of recesses, then, you know, it's, it's midterm campaign home stretch. So do you think you need to have this done when, when both chambers leave for the August recess? I don't know that I can put that type of time limit on it. I would tell you that if we are willing to accommodate each other and work sincerely, we can get there sooner than later, but it has to be done however long it takes. It has to be done. Okay. Last question, and uh, we'll get you out of here on this. The president has talked about these bills off and on. You know, he's got a lot on his plate with the crisis in Ukraine, inflation, still uh, battling COVID. Would it help the conferees or hurt the conferees if the president leaned in, you know, did some travel, did some speeches as you guys do your work? I think encouraging certain members of the House and the Senate to focus on this, especially within his own party, is a good idea. But remember the Constitution. Congress creates the legislation. The president simply signs and implements or vetoes, signs and implements the legislation. It's our responsibility to put a good legislative product on his desk. Right, right. Well, we at CQ Roll Call will be following this. Uh, very closely. We look forward to talking to you again, and thank you for joining us today, Congressman. Absolutely, John. That wraps up today's event. Thank you to our sponsors for joining us and our speakers, of course, for joining us for this important and timely discussion and to the Science and Technology Action Committee for making today's dialogue possible. If you missed any portion of today's program, it will be available on RollCall.com and RollCall's YouTube and Facebook pages. Enjoy the rest of your day.